we commit the bodies of our fallen to space. What's up, Meta Nerds? This video will be a complete breakdown of the Epic Class Heavy Cruiser. We'll go over its history, technical specifications, including the armament, complement, and size comparison, and end on some behind the scenes facts. If you learned something new, please hit the like button, comment any suggestions for future videos, and subscribe if you want to see more. But let's head to the year 2525, the first year of what would become a 27 year long human covenant war. The Epic earned its designation as a heavy carrier, being the largest ship besides the super carriers like the Punic class and Infinity class. At a length of 2,563 meters or 1.59 miles, it was more than twice a marathon and about half an infinity. With a height of 542 meters or a third of a mile, it was about as tall as a Paris class frigate is long or about 11 scarabs stacked on top of each other. While it had a total mass of 35 million metric tons, which is 126 the UNSC Infinity, or about 52 million brutes, or 343 Nimmons class carriers. The Epic was manufactured by Sinoviet Heavy Machinery, the company that produced a lot of military ships and vehicles like the Paris and Autumn class, but also several civilian vehicles, though even those like the HM-1220 were made for civilians that wanted something that was nearly military grade, with their slogan saying that they were aimed at individuals that were quote, regularly shot at. Sino-Viet was likely based in Southeast Asia, Sino meaning Chinese and Viet coming from Vietnam. While they had major facilities in the Kenyan major industrial port city of New Mombasa, and on the human colony world of reach with cities like New Alexandria. Here they also had a ship disassembling facility locating in the Azad, where they were disassembling the UNSC Commonwealth and many other ships at the time of the Covenant invasion, resulting in a major battle that would be remembered as the Fall of Reach. While the company also operated an orbital shipyard above Reach, Naval Yard AS9, that produced the stalwart frigate the UNSC in Ember Clad. For the hull, they would use Titanium A Battle Plate Armor, a material used in most UNSC ships because it is relatively lightweight and extremely durable, while also having a high tolerance to heat. Specifically, it was Titanium 50, with alterations made at the molecular level by adding some classified elements that made it even more durable, while also placing thermal superconducting radiators within the plates for an even more efficient transfer of heat from the plates to space. After the Covenant War erupted, the aliens' use of directed plasma energy weapons required the manufacturers to add even greater energy transfer materials, resulting in thick layers of elastic polymers and intermetallic laminate, a sort of crystalline structure of either two types of metals or a metal and non-metal element. And then the space between the armor plate exterior and the interior walls was filled with a shock hardening fluid that would be the final line of defense from projectiles and also work to flow into and seal small breaches in the hull. It should be noted that even all of this did not stop against the most powerful of Covenant weapons. And the Titanium A would be replaced by Titanium A3, which is what you find in the UNSC Infinity. The ship had a fusion reactor that powered its Shaw Fujikawa Translite engine, the revolutionary device that was created nearly 300 years earlier, the tech that allowed for the expansion of human colonies across the Milky Way galaxy. Its armament was diverse enough to deal with any threat in space, ship to ship, or space to surface engagements. Starting with the weapons placed out on these wings, we have 20 M4020 Bident missile pods out on this flared out midsection which allows you to have more gun placements while providing an additional layer of armor. Enemies targeting this area would only take out your guns and not blast through the hull to other ship crucial areas. These were accelerated by their own scaled down fusion drive and meant for long range use, often firing nuclear pumped X-ray laser warheads, but also being capable of firing kinetic rod bundles or fusion warheads for planetary bombardments. Keep in mind, this, and every weapon mentioned, was designed for use in suppressing the insurrection of human colony worlds, the epic being created before first contact with the Covenant. There were 70 M58 Archer missile pods, with each pod usually containing 24 missiles. These were one of the most common explosive ordinances on a ship, used for ship-to-ship -ship combat, and were like hammer blows, no single missile being strong enough to break through a shield or through decent hull armor, but in great numbers they could pummel their way through. Then we have three different weapon systems to intercept starfighters, boarding craft, and incoming missiles. 20 of the M810 Helix Point Defense Guns, which were AI-operated Gatling guns. 12 M870 Rampart Point Defense Guns, which were also AI-operated, and was configured in twin or quad-mounted 50mm rapid-fire coil guns. 
with the AI detecting the type of threat and automatically switching between sub-caliber armor-piercing sabots or proximity detonation frag shells. The frag would work like a flat gun, but the sub-caliber sabot is a round that is smaller than the diameter of the barrel that fires it, usually encased in something like this. The sabot is what carries the armor-piercing round and fills up the rest of that space in the barrel, and this method allows you to fire a smaller caliber round at a faster velocity than you could otherwise, making it perfect for armor-piercing rounds. The third part of this defensive trio were the 12 M66 Sentry autocannons that would fire essentially bullets or explosive rounds and which would be manned by human personnel, but likely aided by a suite of AI targeting systems as well. And then we have the two Mark 15 Breakwater Naval Coil Guns, which were affectionately called Mini Max, because they work just like this ship's larger 56A2F9 Magnetic Accelerator Cannon, or MAC gun. The Epic had a rapid-fire variant of the MAC that was found on the Stalwart class frigate, and it was strong enough to punch through even the ridiculously reinforced holes mentioned earlier more than enough for human insurgents, and often, but not always, strong enough to get through Covenant shields and armor. This is a form of coil gun, which accelerates the round by sending a current through a series of coils that are wrapped around the barrel, creating a magnetic pull just ahead of the round, a round that was usually several tons of super-dense ferric tungsten. This was the main weapon system of most UNSC ships and orbital defense platforms, often controlled by the ship's AI. You have the mech gun, Cortana. As soon as they come in range, open up. Gladly. And just a side note is that it could fire accurately at such incredible distances that point blank is considered 100 kilometers or 62 miles. As a heavy carrier, it is designed around its complement. And the Epic was able to house 800 UNSC Marines, which was a full battalion, and has over 12 hangars, each of which would house three dropships and two space fighters usually meaning 36 pelicans or condors, or even the stealth insertion craft, the Owl, while those space fighters would be 24 of any combination of C-712 longswords, YSS-1000 sabers, or F-41 broadswords, while the larger C-709 longsword and other ships too big for these hangar bays could attach via a series of clamps and gain access to the Epic via retractable umbilicals. To operate this ship required a crew of 1,300. Common to all UNSC carriers, the crew was composed of Marines and Navy servicemen, which were divided into blue and green quarters, while also having different colored uniforms to distinguish their occupation on board, with red being for ordnance handlers, green for technicians, and white for safety personnel. As for its history, the lead ship was named after its class, as is common for most ships, but other than that, not much is known about the UNSC epic but the UNSC Atlas would play a crucial role in the development of the Spartan II program. John 117 was 14 years old in the year 2525, and it would be on this epic class that he mourned the death of his fellow candidates, children whose bodies could not keep up with the intense battery of chemical and nanotech augmentation, which was required to make these super soldiers that the UNSC needed to don the new Mjolnir suits of armor, in order to finally put an end to the insurrectionists. 27 deceased. 36% of the candidates. Children. 36% of the children. The man who would become known throughout the galaxy as Master Chief, or the Demon, would remain stoic throughout the funeral, watching as his friends were buried in space. Fired out into a nearby star, caskets draped in the flag of the UNSC. Soon after this, 117 would be tested by the program's directors when they orchestrated a fight with ODSTs in one of the ship's gyms. After the Helljumpers provoked the boy, John was able to disable and even kill some of them, all without taking a hit. A remarkable display that convinced everyone that these children that were able to withstand the augmentations truly had become the greatest soldiers the UNSC had ever seen. Though this fight would also create tensions for the next 30 years between the ODSTs and Spartans. 27 years later, an epic would be involved in the Battle of Sigma Octanus IV as a part of Battlegroup Leviathan, which consisted of one Marathon-class heavy cruiser, the eponymous UNSC Leviathan, 15 destroyers, 30 frigates, and one refit station. Even in what would prove to be the final year of the Human Covenant War, the UNSC was still greatly overpowered in almost every engagement. Leviathan would lose more than 20 ships in this battle, with nearly all ships of the battlegroup suffering heavy damage. With the Covenant turning their assault to Reach, they separated the battle group, sending half of their forces to the colony world, and the other half staying behind to ward off a potential Covenant return. 
The damage these ships suffered staggered their arrival to reach, with the first coming out of slip space on August 1st, and the last on August 12th of that year. In the subsequent battle with the Covenant fleets, all of these ships were destroyed except for the UNSC Gettysburg, and even it had its entire crew slaughtered when it was docked at a refit station over reach. This would be the last we hear of any epic class in service, but they were not decommissioned, and so we should expect that there are still plenty spread throughout the stars protecting humanity's interests. So that's it for its breakdown, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. This ship was first introduced in the novel The Fall of Reach, with its interior being described in the novel Helljumper. Though it was first visually depicted for its creation in the tabletop game Halo Fleet Battles, and was based on concept art from Halo 2, Halo Wars, and Halo 4. It was meant to be a visual combination of ships like the Phoenix, Halcyon, Marathon, and the Infinity. This should be considered the official depiction, but note that it has major differences in the Fall of Reach comic, and even some slight differences along the dorsal side in the Fall of Reach animated series. And I just wanted to note that most of the tech in the Halo universe is based on either existing real tech, or plausible future inventions based on real physics. Like everything from the subcaliber rounds to the intermetallic and fluid armor paneling. So that's it for the Epic Class Heavy Carrier. If you like this video, please hit that like button and leave a comment. It really does help with the YouTube algorithm. And you can ask any questions you still had or make suggestions for future videos. Also check out the description for more ways to support the channel, like our affiliate links to cool metal print art, or pick up audiobooks of some of those great Halo books I mentioned, all available on Audible. And you'll also see our Patreon and PayPal. Special shout out to our $25 tier, Chris Garcia, Cass Costello, C7Go, Matthew Beltrami, Seraph Diaz, and Bill Payne. But most important of all, remember, don't bully people in the gym. You don't know what kind of experimental Spartan juice they're on, and experimenting on children will be forgiven if it saves the human race. Always.